Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to stand up one second to see how packed this room is. This afternoon, we have a showcase panel here at the 8th Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Here in Rio, we have a showcase panel with whom else than Mr. Glenn Greenwald. Before we go off on a, what will be a really interesting session, I have to lay down a few ground rules with you. And um, what is, we're going to open up plenty of rooms for questions. There will be students in the orange shirts running around with microphones. If you have a question, stand up, indicate you do, and they will come to you. And we might at some point just have two of them standing here lining up. So you can stand there, I will get to you. If you have a question, please keep it short and sweet. Not sweet, no, we're going to grill you. Keep it short. Do make sure there's a question in there. No rambling statements. And apart from that, we're going to enjoy the presence of the journalist that's keeping us all busy and keeping a lot of governments busy. My name is Margot Smit. I run the uh, Investigative Association of the Netherlands and Belgium. And I'm your moderator this afternoon, but the floor is to Mr. Glenn Greenwald. Does he need an introduction? I'll give you one, a short one. He was born, you can correct me where I go wrong. I'll fact check you. Good, good, good. Glenn Greenwald was born on March 6, 1967 in New York City, but you moved shortly after that with your family to Fort Lauderdale in Florida. You were, when a senior in high school, you ran for the city council, but unsuccessfully. We'll get to that. You earned a BA from George Washington University and a JD, a law degree from New York University Law School in 1994. Then you practiced law until 2002, went into consulting and started writing a blog in 2005. You investigated important and sensitive stories then already, like the Valerie Plain affair, and um, then you did the surveillance, the warrantless surveillance by the NSA. In 2007, Greenwald started to contribute to Salon.com, and in 2012 you left for The Guardian as you said, to reach a broader audience and internationalize your readership. Well, we can say you did that. I'm going to um, read a short quote, something you said in one of the newspapers I recently read, where you quote, were saying on surveillance, people who accept surveillance and are being spied upon turn themselves into slaves. It is crucial to human freedom to be able to do things nobody sees that nobody can pass judgment on. Only then can we be creative, only then can we discover our true way of being. A society in which people are under constant surveillance breeds conformism. Surveillance kills the very soul of a human being. Is that why you did the stories you did? Afraid of that people's souls would be killed? I'm not sure it was quite that melodramatic, that it was, uh, I was afraid that, that people's souls would be killed, although I do think that there's a lot of different dangers that come from this mass surveillance state, one of which is the fact that human beings do change their behavior and change their way of being when they know that they're constantly watched. And what's interesting is you can often have people who say, and I'm sure everybody in this room has heard it at one point or another, I don't really understand why I should care if I'm being surveilled, if my emails are being read or my chats are being observed, because I don't really feel like I have anything to hide, so I don't think the government's particularly interested in me. And I think there's lots of reasons that you can know that people who say that don't really mean it. They put passwords on their email accounts and social networks. They put locks on their bedroom and bathroom doors. Every single time somebody says to me, I have nothing to hide and therefore I don't actually care if I'm being surveilled. Literally over the last two years, I've always said, well, if that's the case, please give me all of the emails, passwords that you have to all of your accounts and let me troll through your emails and publish whatever it is that I want at any time. And not one person has yet taken me up on that offer. Because I think people intuitively know that there's an incredible value to having a realm that as human beings we can go into and explore boundaries and test 
limit and decide who we want to be as individuals without the prying eyes of other people cast upon us. And I do think that a society in which you know that you're always being watched is one in which you will, even if you don't consciously realize it, always opt toward the behavior that is most approved, is most conformist, is, is the narrowest range of options, and you really lose a vital part of human freedom when you live in a surveillance state. Let's go take it one step back. You ran for the city council for Fort Lauderdale when you were 17. That is true, right? How, how come? Uh, I was actually manipulated by my grandfather into that, um, although I, I, he, he was somebody, he was on the city council, he had run as kind of this outsider insurgent candidate and was waging all these battles against sort of the powers that existed in the city at the time. And he got too old and, and retired, but he wanted to continue to fight these battles and, and sort of push me into running for the city council to continue them. But I actually was somebody really well versed in city council affairs because I was always at his side. And it was sort of a novelty candidacy at first. I was 17, but it got taken seriously. Were um, you the youngest candidate ever? Yeah, it was, I mean, there was actually a big debate about whether or not I could even legally run because I wasn't going to be, I wasn't 18 at the time. I, I registered, but I was going to be 18 by the time of the election. But the thing it actually taught me um, is that the most noble thing you can do is use your talents and skills and energies not in service of those in power, but against those in power. And that's what I sort of tried to do in the journal. What was the ticket you ran on? It was nonpartisan. I think actually, I, I, it was it was also a lesson in tawdry politics. I think I, I got convinced to try and run a fear mongering campaign. The senior citizens in the city were the biggest voting bloc, so I was trying to scare them. I think into believing that the incumbents were going to uh, negotiate the contract poorly with the police and they were going to lose police protection. And I felt awful about the entire campaign because it was so manipulative and exploitative. So I probably deserved to lose. How many votes did you get? Remember? Actually, um, I almost won. Um, sadly enough, I came in fourth out of a six-person field, and the top three candidates won. So, so you barely, you, you know, barely didn't make it. I barely escaped the horrors of a career in politics. What would we have missed of, um, out on if we, if you had won? <laughs> but then you became a lawyer. Now you're a journalist. What made you switch to journalism? It, it was pretty much the, I, I wasn't particularly politically engaged prior to um, the September 11th attacks. I mean, I was somebody who sort of read the newspaper every day, did the sort of normal things that ordinary citizens do, thinking they're paying attention to politics. Um, but it was really September 11th and, and the way that the climate in the United States politically so radically changed that made me pay a lot closer attention, in part because I lived in New York, but also in part because even when... I was a lawyer, the thing I often cared most about was thinking about ways to limit and restrain government power. And thinking that as long as government power was sufficiently restrained, that there were sufficient checks on what people in power were doing, that our society would basically be more or less preserved in terms of the important political values. And what 9-11 really did was usher in this era of a lack of limits on what those in power could do. People in power began being able to operate with greater secrecy than they ever had before being able to do things that had previously been unimaginable, like putting people in prison without charges or even lawyers, including Americans captured on American soil, and just in generally embracing this climate that I thought was really unhealthy. And, and what I always thought was that journalistic outlets, media institutions would never allow government to go beyond certain lines. One of those lines I thought would be imprisoning people without charges. And to watch the government go beyond those lines so easily without any media backlash, in fact, with great amounts of media support, sort of convinced me that there was this gaping hole in journalism that needed to be filled, which was the function that I thought journalists were there to serve, which was to always push back on what government could do um, or to safeguard against abuses. And, and so I just tried to find a way to participate in the conversation and, and fill the holes that I thought weren't being filled. But Recently, you said the idea of a free press is that it can operate as a counterbalance to prevent the systematic abuse of power, but in the U.S. that is no longer true. American journalism is almost embraced or, you know, by, by the authorities, by the government, and that's why I went into journalism. I was determined not to play along with that, so you got disappointed in 
the profession of or the professionals in journalism pretty quickly? Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the first experiences I ever had was um, I, I began writing about politics at the end of 2005. I created a blog one day, sitting in my apartment, not very far from here, with no plan. I just spontaneously created it. I just had this desire to say some things, even though nobody was listening at the time. Um, and probably six weeks later, the New York Times published an article revealing that the National Security Agency was spying on the telephone conversations of Americans without the warrants required by law. There was a law in place that said it's a crime to spy on Americans' conversation unless you first go to a court and get a warrant. And the New York Times revealed that the government was doing exactly that which the law made a crime to do. And what was amazing to me was after I read that article, maybe two weeks after that, I had learned that the reporters who broke that story, Jim Risen and Eric Litzblau, had actually learned that this was happening 15 months earlier, in the middle of 2004. And they wrote the article and they wanted to report it. It was six months before George Bush was going to stand for re-election, so they wanted to inform the American public that the government was spying on them in exactly the ways the law barred. And the editor of the New York Times at the time, Bill Keller, and the publisher were called into the White House when they told the government that they intended to publish this article. And George Bush himself told the executive editor of the New York Times, Bill Keller, do not publish this article. If you tell the world that we're spying on people without warrants, it will endanger national security, it will help the terrorists. And rather than do what they ought to have done, which was laugh in the face of the president for making such an absurd claim and suggesting that the newspaper would sit on this story, they actually obeyed the dictate. They, they did sit on, sit on the story for 15 months, let George Bush get reelected, knowing that he was doing this and not having told the public that it was happening. Um, and then the only reason why they ever ended up publishing it, even at the end of 2005, was because one of their reporters, Jim Risen, had had enough of being silenced, wrote a book in which he was going to break the story anyway. The New York Times didn't want to get scooped by their own reporter. So the idea that a major media outlet that I always thought of as this liberal guardian of civil liberties and pushback against the government, the most influential media outlet in the world, the New York Times, would have suppressed a story for that long because the government ordered them to do so in the wake of everything that happened in the run-up to the Iraq war was really reflective of not just occasional defects with journalism, but a really fundamental sickness, um, not just in the American media, but the Western press. And, and that really shaped what I think about these issues a lot. So was that also a reason not to go to like a regular newspaper, but to work for a blog? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting because I see like young journalism students here, some of whom I spoke with a little bit before the event. And I think the most exciting thing by far about journalism across the world, and this is a really new phenomenon, is if you wanted to go into journalism even 10 years ago, as recently as 10 years ago, and you wanted to have a large audience, you basically had to go and work for one of these huge corporations that own media outlets, which means you had to submit yourself to all of their extraordinarily suffocating constraints about how you can and cannot do journalism. You would have to confine yourself to the narrow range of viewpoints that they permit to be heard because they consider those to be the full range of legitimate views. Because of the internet, if you want to now go and develop a large readership or become a journalist, you don't have to submit yourself to any of those constraints. You can go and just start a blog and find a way to get people to pay attention by becoming an expert in two or three different fields by offering commentary that nobody else is offering and build a huge audience with absolutely no limitations of any kind. I mean, that's what I did. A lot of people have done that. It's really democratized political discourse. It's diversified journalism. It's really put a lot of pressure on these large media outlets um, to start changing their behavior, and I think it's incredibly encouraging. So, as somebody said recently, um, this, is, this may not be the, the golden age for media, but it is the golden age for journalism. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most exciting and encouraging things is that all of these old media institutions are failing and dying. Um, I mean, that's a really great thing to celebrate because what it's forcing them to I do... I guess some people here in the audience from those old media might not agree with you. Yeah, I mean, no one likes to see anybody lose their job or institutions fail. That's not the reason that it's good. It's good because it's forcing these institutions to re-examine their fundamental premises about how they function and they're becoming better as a result. But what it also means is that journalism is becoming much more 
diversified. So even though the New York Times is laying off large numbers of people, or the Washington Post is, or European media outlets are, there's all kinds of new media outlets doing much more interesting and innovative things that are constantly emerging and, and springing up that are giving journalists, young journalists, a way to make a living um, without having to go and work for those institutions. So the fact that the big media outlets are dying, to me, isn't a sign that journalism is dying. As you suggested, it's a sign that journalism is thriving. It's just going to other places. We, these conferences, of the, you know, the one like this, are about methodologies. We're teaching each other, we're learning from each other, learning to cooperate. And um, so we want to talk a little methodology with you, and uh, we'll see how far we can get you. <laughs> um, you've been reporting on the documents given to you and Laura Poitras, the American documentary filmmaker that you've been working with since June 5 of this year. Do you remember that day, seeing the first story come out? What did you think? Yeah, I mean, that entire sort of, I, I spent 11 days or so in Hong Kong, um, and the entire thing was a complete blur because it was so intense and so surreal. We were sleeping literally 90 minutes a night. Um, but, you know, my big concern once I got these documents, and not just my concern, but also the concern of my source, Edward Snowden, was that once we got the documents, we then had to persuade large media institutions to be willing to publish them. And as you know, I had just indicated, that's not as easy of a thing to do as one might think. You would think large media outlets would be salivating to publish stories like this, but they actually, their first instinct institutionally is caution and fear. And Even your own medium, The Guardian? Yeah, I mean, the reason that I went to The Guardian was because they're better than most other institutions of similar size. In that regard, they have a history of some pretty fearless and intrepid journalism. At the same time, they were being told by their lawyers that it was very possible that the FBI could storm into the offices of The Guardian in New York at any moment and seize all the material, that the UK government, where there's no constitutional press protections, could try and shut down their reporting, and that proved to be pretty prescient because now the UK government is attempting to do exactly that and worse, even now threatening criminal investigations. So there was definitely this very substantial, sustained moment at The Guardian where even though they realized the significance of the material and how journalistically overwhelmingly important it was, um, there was a real moment of indecision about is this something that we can really pursue as aggressively as we want or are we going to allow the normal institutional constraints to limit us and it was far from clear what would happen and so when we got that first article published and the worldwide reaction was so positive and intense it sort of infected the Guardian editors and they wanted to keep publishing after that and, and this kind of bravery and, and this journalistic spirit really got animated and it caused us to publish one story after the next for five straight days um, in a way that was really inspiring, but it was far from clear that that would happen. So that was definitely a big moment of victory and celebration when that first article finally got published. That's a big high, isn't it? Have you come down from it yet? No, no, I'm still pretty high. <laughs> so, um, but before you know, you actually uh, got the Guardian to publish the, the, the material, you had to convince them it was genuine. You had to figure out whether it was genuine. How did you do that? What can you tell us about, because you don't send out an email to the NSA and say, hey, since when did you start spying on me? So how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, obviously when you get contacted by a source who claims to be wanting to provide you with enormous amounts of top secret documents, your first thoughts are things like, is this person genuine? Is he sane? Um, is, is this part of some entrapment scheme? Um, is this a way to destroy your credibility by feeding you false documents the way that the U.S. Army had plotted in 2008 to do to WikiLeaks to give them fake documents so when they published it, it would destroy their credibility? So if you're going to attach yourself to a story like this, of course, the first responsibility that you have to yourself, if to nothing else, is to ensure that it's authentic. And it's not that easy to do. And ultimately, what you really have to do is rely on your judgment and your intuition. Um, there's never any mathematical proof that you can get that these things are accurate. So the first thing that Laura and I did when we got to Hong Kong was we put Snowden into a room for six hours, literally. We almost imprisoned him. We didn't let him go to the bathroom. We didn't give him any water. We didn't waterboard him or anything, but we did everything kind of short of that. And the idea was to really relentlessly interrogate him. 
um, and to test the authenticity of what it was that he was saying. And at the end of the six hours, I didn't have the slightest doubt that not only was he exactly who he said he was, and not only were the documents exactly what he represented them to be, but most importantly to me, that his motives in why he unraveled his whole life in order to bring these documents to the world were exactly what he said they were, which was that it was just an act of conscience um, that he could no longer in good faith sit by silently and allow this to happen without the world knowing about it. And so once we both reached the conclusion that this was all real, um, all we wanted to do then was go forward and, and, and publish. Are you a computer buff? Do you know how to go into metadata and stuff like that and check these kind of documents? No, and I mean, no. And, and you but, didn't think that was Laura, necessary? But Laura was. Laura, Laura has a lot of expertise. But, but ultimately, that doesn't really do you much good. I mean, you can go and, and look at the metadata documents. You have to know, document. you know whether the documents are real, right? Right. I mean, yeah. good forgeries are, are going to pass all those tests. Um, you know, part of, the, part of the issue was just the sheer number of documents. There were thousands upon thousands of documents. So had this been something other than completely real, it would have been one of the most extraordinary forgeries in the history of, of fraud. Diaries, but then... <laughs> yeah, someone would have really put a huge amount of effort into, um, into, into doing this. Um, but ultimately, you know, as human beings, you have to judge other human beings. You rely on your own. Uh, since obviously we, we vetted him, we saw his CIA documents, his diplomatic passport, his identification, but none of that gives you anywhere near the assurance of putting your name and your career credibility on the line, which is what you do when you report something like this. Um, so I think the most important thing is just to feel in your gut that this is something that is real and, and is right. And to How me, do you develop important. such a gut feeling? What's that? How do you develop such a gut feeling? Because it's not there when you're 18 and running for the city council, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it, I think when I was 18 or when I was, you know, 23, I thought age was nothing but a disability, right? Something that, you know, I thought, like a lot of people who are 18 or 23, that you could do everything and needed no help. But I think one of the things that, that you know, that experience does give you is this capacity to judge situations in an intuitive way, one that kind of escapes rationality. You can't put your finger quite exactly on why you trust your own judgment, um, but you come to sort of feel out who's lying and who's telling the truth and, and what's real and what isn't in a way that's really important. Um, because a lot of times as journalists, it's not a science, it's an art. And you need to be able to develop ways to trust your ability to, to know those things. Um, you said uh, the first responsibility is to yourself. Are you... You know, is this genuine? Can I publish this? But the other one is to your source. Did you ever consider publishing um, only after he had left Hong Kong? Did you think about that? Yeah, I mean, w this was, you know, the, the whole interaction with Snowden was radically different than almost every single case of a journalist dealing with the source. Almost always when a source comes to a journalist, especially with, more, with sensitive materials, in fact, the more sensitive the material, the more likely it is to happen, the source wants to hide who it is, his identity. He wants to remain concealed for a lot of obvious reasons. Snowden was exactly the opposite. When he came to us, he said, the minute you begin publishing, I want my name attached to this material. And we actually had to spend a lot of time in Hong Kong that first week convincing him to let us publish four or five stories before we actually unveiled him in order to let the focus be on the substance of the disclosures rather than demonizing and personalizing him. So you and did try to take your responsibility as a reporter and say, don't do this, don't get your face out there. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, when, when it's a difficult situation because when someone like Snowden comes to you and says, not only do I know that I'm going to be discovered, I want to actually reveal myself. And his explanation was very compelling. He said, I believe that if I'm going to do something that has this profound an effect on huge numbers of people, on governments, on world, the world, that I have an obligation to account for what I did. I don't want to hide. I want to come forward and say, my name is Edward Snowden, this is what I did, and this is why I did it. Which is an incredibly noble and, and courageous thing to do. And, but at the same time, you want to make sure that, again, that the person who's making that choice is making it with full eyes open about what the, the likely implications are, that they're not doing it impetuously because they woke up on the wrong side of the bed one day, that they're emotionally unstable at that moment for whatever reasons, that it's truly a choice of autonomy and agency. 
And so Laura and I spent the vast bulk of our time that first week making certain that he fully understood exactly what the implications were likely to be of his being revealed um, and that it was a real choice. And once we were convinced that it was, he's an adult and he does have autonomy. And, but you and did try to talk about it. That's his right to do. And, and so I didn't think it was my place to talk him out of it. Um, I thought it was my place to make sure that he had a full understanding of everything that was going to happen, and he absolutely did. And you um, didn't say, let's wait with publishing till you're out of Hong Kong or in a safe place? Well, I mean, what, what's interesting about this is that he chose Hong Kong for a lot of different complicated reasons. And before we, I even knew his name, before I even really talked to him or got any documents from him, before I talked to him in a substantive way, he was already in Hong Kong. And he was determined to stay in Hong Kong because he felt as though there weren't that many places on earth that could and would protect him once the United States said, give us this person to imprison. There just aren't that many nations in the world who have both the willingness and the power Can to protect somebody. Is there one that you would have... Well, I mean, the, the other problem is that the, the list of countries that could and would do that are not necessarily countries that you want to be in. So he didn't want to be in mainland China. He actually didn't want to be in Russia. Um, there were a lot of countries where he didn't want to go because he at least wanted to be in a place where he felt like the political values were ones that he was comfortable with. Hong Kong has a history of dissent and free speech. They have huge marches to denounce Tiananmen Square um, abuses. And so it was this balancing act that, he, you know, one of the things he said was like, look, if you are going to leak, on, you know, tens of thousands of top secret documents and make yourself the most wanted man in the world from the world's most powerful government, you actually don't have that many good choices, right? Like all of your choices are going to be bad choices. And so he wanted to make sure that he was in a place that could, could protect him and that was also reasonably politically free. And so Hong Kong was the place that he had chosen where he was determined to stay, and again, it wasn't up to us to try and plan out his escape route or to tell him where it was that he ought to go. Um, he had planned this for a very long time. He's an extremely smart and thoughtful individual um, and is a very strong-willed as well. And, and so that was his choice and wasn't looking for advice on how to change that. You think you would have listened if you had said, go to Belgium. They have great protection of sources law. Yeah, first of all, um, if I had told him to go to Belgium and he had listened, he probably would be in an American prison by now, only because small countries don't do that well when resisting huge amounts of American pressure. Um, and uh, I don't think he would have listened anyway, um, only because he had spent so long evaluating these choices, um, and he had a plan, and, and he was convinced it was the right one. I'm going to do two more questions, and then we're going to open it up to you, because you will have tons of questions. You said... Once in one of the many, many interviews that you've done uh, that you, um, Laura and, and uh, Snowden, became a team. That's, t a pretty, uh, um, that's getting pretty close to your source. Is there something like professional distance that you need to keep? I don't think so. I mean, I know that there are all these unwritten rules of journalism, like you don't express your opinion on matters that you're reporting on. Um, you don't get too close to your source. I don't know who wrote these rules or where they come from, or who decreed them. But what I know is that these are the rules that are abided by, by a profession that I think has become extremely corrupted. So the fact that there are these rules that this profession abides by is not a reason for me to abide by them. It's a reason for me to violate them. So you know, I'm very clear about the fact that I consider what Edward Snowden did to be heroic. Um, I consider it to be noble and brave. Um, I'm thrilled that he came forward because I think the world should know exactly what it is that the United States and its closest allies are doing in the world. I care about him as a human being. I don't think he should be imprisoned. I'm against his persecution. I believe he should have asylum. Um, and so when you spend 11 days with somebody, and you know, I spent weeks talking to him before that, and I've spoken with him more or less every day since, and have gone through something as, as intense um, as the experience that we shared with Laura, um, I'm not going to pretend that I'm uh, a robot and that I have no concerns for him um, or that I don't support what he did. I do support what he did, um, and I do care about him as a person, and I do consider us having worked together jointly with Laura towards these goals that journalism is about, which is transparency and holding people in power accountable, and I'm not going to pretend that that's not true. 
Okay, you say uh, journalism has become a corrupted profession. Um, it doesn't make you popular with a lot of colleagues. You get grilled a lot in interviews. Um, who keeps you sane? You've become bigger than your story almost. So what do you do? Do you have a secret recipe you can share with us? Any of these people that might get into a situation like yours in the future perhaps, what do you do to keep sane and not get big-headed or... I mean, I come to conferences like this, you know, and I, I mean, I've spent the last three days interacting with investigative journalists from around the world, many of whom are incredibly brave, who uh, wake up every day and think about how to dig and expose the secrets of those who are in power. Um, sometimes they don't get much attention, and sometimes they do. Um, but when I hear of, from the people like that, whose work I have extreme amounts of respect for, people who are putting themselves at risk, who are in war zones, who are battling the power factions in their own country, tell me that they're supportive of what I've done, it makes it incredibly easy to sustain the attacks of people who are sort of the actors who play the role of journalists on television. And, um, you know, I think that there is a huge community of people who believe in real journalism. I think that community is growing. A big part of what we tried to do with the way we did this story was to revitalize this notion of what true adversarial journalism is about, to sort of break the climate of fear that has been created for journalists and their sources deliberately by the United States and the UK and, and other Western nations. Um, and so when I hear from people who um, are supportive, who are fellow journalists, um, of whom there are many, many doing real journalism, the kind that make me proud to call myself a journalist, um, that's all the support I really need as well. So France and Spain, here he comes. Glenn Greenwald, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.